How many of you grew up in Champaign County? Okay, maybe 5% of those present. Of the rest of you who are here who aren't speakers, how many moved to Champaign County specifically to come to this event? <laughs> Nobody. You had no idea that one of the consequences of your actions would be to spend a Saturday here listening to all sorts of people talking about all sorts of interesting ideas. Finding something that's worthwhile when looking for something else or not looking for anything at all is serendipity. My thesis today is that serendipity is a better driver of the future than a carefully planned, carefully executed path. And we have a basis for that from, of all things, physics. In the early part of the 20th century, Henry Poincaré was looking at the three-body problem of which we heard briefly earlier. And there is a parameter, the Lyapunov exponent, that talks about the trajectories of particles launched on ballistic trajectories uh, in a physical system where there are slight differences in how we start them out. So if we take two particles, we put them next to each other, and we launch them with nearly the same velocity, what happens? Well, there's only three possibilities. They get closer together, they get farther apart, or they stay at the same distance. If they stay at the same distance apart that they started, that's a Lyapunov exponent of zero. If they get farther apart, the Lyapunov exponent is positive, and if it's negative, then, of course, they get closer together. So if we put our grandkids on a swing and we push them and they go high or we push them real hard and they go way high, asymptotically, the Lyapunov exponent is negative and the swing ends up hanging straight down. In the real world, life has a huge positive Lyapunov exponent. That is, looking into the future, we really don't know what's going to happen. Looking back into the past, we have a pretty good idea what happened. At least each of us thinks we know what happened. There was a talk earlier this morning that said maybe we don't. But in any event, if we can't predict the future really well, how can we predict the results of research? We can't. So how do we fund research in this country? We have people write detailed proposals, and we critique them. Oh, there's a problem on page eight. Dead. Who is it that gets funded? The people that write the perfect proposals. But if we're going to make discoveries, we're going to be diverging from what we thought we were going to be able to do. So is this just a belly aching uh, professor, or is this something where his history gives us some guidance? Here we have a plot of the trajectories of the importance of the work of two of the 19th century's most inventive people. Thomas Edison in the green line, and James Clerk Maxwell on the red line. We start in 1865. Edison is a telegrapher. Nobody ever heard of him. Maxwell has just published the first version of his uh, differential equations describing electricity and magnetism as a unified field. If you got a proposal from each of these two people asking for support in doing science or engineering, which would you fund? It's obvious. Maxwell had accomplishment. Edison was nobody. Wait 10 years. Now it's 1875. Maxwell published a second version of his laws in 1870, and then what happened? Meanwhile, Edison has several dozen patents on the improvement of telegraphy. So maybe you fund Maxwell as a legacy researcher, but uh, this Edison guy, he seems to be on a really, uh, he's really on a roll. 1885. Maxwell's equations have now been around for 20 years. Nobody's seen these electromagnetic waves he talked about. Meanwhile, Edison has invented the light bulb, invented the phonograph, invented the industrial research lab, invented the trolley car, invented the electric power grid. I guess Edison was a success and Maxwell was a failure. Except in 1887, Heinrich Hertz found those waves. And in 1900, we got radio. And nowadays, it turns out that the entire modern world works off Maxwell, and after 2014, it will be illegal in this country to make Edisonian light bulbs. <laughs> so if you fund on the basis of impact and broad, uh, of broader impacts and intellectual uh, merit, you make the wrong decision half the time, and that's where we already know what the impact was. There's another situation of about the same time. 1881, 
This time over in Germany, the gasoline-powered automobile was invented. If we got proposals for the improvement of transportation in 1881, which is going to get the grant? A better buggy whip or a better internal combustion engine? What's the impact of an internal combustion engine? Nobody knew it at the time. I mean, the railroads were powered off steam. So the higher risk, lower impact approach is what actually ended up winning the day. Well, it actually may turn out, I mean, I'm casting aspersions on buggy whips. What happens when we run out of oil? We may go back to animal power. Maybe we need to read some of those old papers. <laughs> All of us, when we were children, learned about Alexander Fleming. He was the person who left the lab on Friday afternoon with the Petri dish left open, came back Monday morning, saw there was a region where the bacteria weren't growing, and instead of throwing it away, said, hmm, I wonder what caused that. So if you wrote a proposal to the not yet existent National Institutes of Health, what would the proposal have said? There's some dirt in our lab. We'd like to figure out what it's doing. That's going to have a high probability of funding, isn't it? In fact, this is a, a bit of a side issue that we need to uh, talk about. There is, from history, a, uh, an approach to this that was described by the uh, military historian Basil Little Hart in his book, Strategy. It's called The Importance of the Indirect Approach. Suppose that I was some nefarious person and I decided I wanted to bop somebody in the front row in the nose. If I were to say, I am going to hit you in the nose at the count of 10. One, two, well, you know what's going to happen. If I get anywhere close to seven, the organizers are going to grab me off the stage and throw me in the county lockup. That's a direct approach to being offensive. An indirect approach is to say nothing until I happen to see him out there in the uh, uh, lounge. No, I'm not actually going to do this. But the point is, if you don't broadcast what you're doing by indirection, it, you have a much higher probability of success. Well, the same thing is true in medical research. In Fleming's case, he invented the field of antibiotics. This is good. It saves lives. No, this is bad. Uh, we get bacterial resistance. Well, maybe we can do something about that. You can't know the consequences of your action in advance. So in 1969, the NIH, in its wisdom, with a lot of prodding from the executive uh, branch, decided to declare war on cancer. Many of you remember that? The idea was that we already knew everything we needed to know about biology in order to cure cancer, and all we had to do was fund massive clinical studies. Didn't work, did it? What did work was all that virology down in the noise, which eventually gave us enough understanding of basic biochemistry that there are now a handful of drugs which really do protect us against some forms of cancer. The NIH now has a program of translational medicine. The idea is to fund research will have immediate impact on our health. Is that going to be what's most effective in the long run? I suspect not. Well, my own career, in fact, follows the same sort of uh, trajectory. Don't even try to read this. It's completely incoherent. <laughs> and that's because random interactions with random people at random time gave me random ideas that ended up being actually fairly useful. The CV starts out by saying, as an undergraduate, I did research on how to quantify phosphate in water, because phosphate was a major contaminant in those days. The amount of phosphate in dishwashing detergent has gone down and down and down until finally your uh, the uh, fluid you put in your dishwasher now probably doesn't even work. But back then, quantifying it was a big issue. And then I went to graduate school and I learned all about atomic spectroscopy because back in the uh, 1970s and 80s, the metals industry was a really important uh, field in this country and coming up with more efficient ways to characterize metals, that was really high technology. Then I got interested in biochemical dynamics by a story that's too convoluted for now. But it turns out that all the mathematics and all the viewpoint from these earlier two areas were really important in figuring out how to make measurements to look at the dynamics of enzyme systems. So I have all this instrumentation, and into my office walks an old friend who says, why are you wasting your time on that? And it turns out that some of the same instrumentation is useful for doing research on noise-induced hearing loss. Turn down that iPod. You never know from what direction a new insight is going to come. 
And in fact, in having problems getting some of this funded, I had a little bit of spare time on my hands, got involved with a program that we have doing uh, chemistry teaching in Hanoi, Vietnam, and came up with the need to design the world's cheapest spectrophotometer. It stinks. It's bad, except for teaching, where it's easy to see what goes wrong with it, and therefore it's good for students to figure out how things work. So this is what the CV looks like. This is the reality. And I suspect that I'm not the only scientist for which this is true. So how do we get to the point where we can admit that, in fact, a linear trajectory is not as effective as one where we can follow our senses and work on what seems to be exciting at the time? I have two modest suggestions. Modest suggestion number one. If we find a proposal that's perfect, where we guarantee it's going to give wonderful results, don't fund it. If we find a proposal that has flaws, so that somebody's going to have to use some ingenuity to figure out how to work around those flaws, give it a try. Secondly, one of the reasons why we have this need for perfection is that there are more people that are looking for resources than the resource base we have. What would happen if we fired a third of the faculty at our major research universities? Suddenly, we would need to have heavier teaching loads for those left behind. They would have lower demand for research funds because they wouldn't have time to spend them anyway. They'd train fewer graduate students, and yet if the resource base stayed the same, those who were there would be able to get more work done. Well, I know what you're thinking. If you think this is such a great idea, you resign first. <laughs> Not quite what I had in mind. The point of all this is, if we decide on the purpose of something after we already know how it works, we're much more likely to succeed than if we think we have the audacity to know where our work leads. In other words, if we want to find what target to shoot at, it's much easier if we draw the target after the darts are already in the wall. Thank you.